Hi, it's David from Outrage Overload. As you may know, we don't accept paid advertisements, but I want to tell you about something from friend of the show, Dr. Peter Coleman. Tired of toxic politics? Probably, if you're listening to this show. I'm not usually one for New Year's resolutions, but this year, how about a resolution that bites back? Join the 30-Day Polarization Detox Challenge. Visit outrageoverload.net slash pdc. Okay, let's start the show. Welcome to Outrage Overload, a science podcast about outrage and lowering the temperature. This is episode 30. News outlets were once beacons of shared information, anchoring communities in a common reality. Here's Peter Ditto. Other things that are, I think, are really different, right? The, the media environment is one that's you know, clear, right? It used to be that you, know, you could believe any crazy thing you thought during the day, and then you turned on Walter Cronkite, you know, it's at uh, six o'clock or whatever, and you know, he told you what the facts were. He said, well, I guess I was wrong. And that's the way it is. Friday, March 6, 1981. But we should be mindful that this golden age of TV news was more an aberration in history. News before then was often the megaphone of the privileged, a carefully curated tapestry woven to serve agendas rather than inform. The era of the yellow press saw journalism morph into a spectacle, lurid tales of exaggerated claims battling for eyeballs on newsstands, teeting on sensationalism and stoking public fears or the state-controlled broadcast painting reality with the brush of propaganda. But during that blip in history, the so-called golden age of TV, news spoke to a wide audience, so it tended to be less partisan. Also, it wasn't driven by clicks or viewers so much. It wasn't a profit center in itself, but was funded by entertainment programming. There was no 24-hour news cycle. With fragmentation and more options for viewers, that changed. Here is Yevgeny Simkin. I was at CBS News when... The incentives actually flipped. Uh, I, I watched it happen um, in real time. So let's go back 25 years. And I'm at CBS News. And one week we have <clears throat> Dan Rather comes down into our technology pit and gives us a very Braveheart-esque speech on the, 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 the integrity of Edward R. Murrow, whose mural was there. He could actually point to it and say, we, we all live in the shadow of greatness, and we are obligated to adhere to the, I guess we call it ethics and morals of, of, of this medium. Um, and we're a lost leader, and CBS will continue to sell its David Letterman's and its uh, CSI's and et cetera in order to fund our operation and uh, and so far. And, and, and that sounded great. Um, and then <clears throat> within weeks of that, uh, we had uh, our mandate entirely altered recalibrating the entire incentive structure of news and and realizing that they don't have to be a lost leader anymore. They can, in fact, be a profit center. Um, and it's just a matter of compelling advertisers to to pay them a lot of money to flash their stuff on the screen. At the time, I thought this was egregious and, and, and despicable. Um, and today, I still think it was <laughs> egregious and despicable. But that was the beginning of that of this of this era of, of news production, where the incentives are to make money at any at any cost. And, uh, and the, the easiest way to make money is to produce content that is uh, aggravating and infuriating and upsetting and terrifying, which depending on who, which media you're reading, it, it, it goes from being mostly benign, but sometimes leaning into this, you know, like, like culture of, of, of terror into just, just overtly egregious where, you know, you're gonna die, click here to find out when. These days, we're bombarded by a dizzying array of perspectives, algorithms feeding us our own outrage du jour, and the truth feels as fragmented as a dropped kaleidoscope. It's a media landscape where clicks trump facts, and finding common ground feels like searching for a needle in an outrage overload haystack. 
It's enough to make you want to throw your phone in a lake and build a news-free cabin in the woods. But here's the thing, giving up on news isn't the answer either. We need to understand this fragmented media landscape if we're ever going to master it. And that's what we're going to talk about on this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. I'm your host, David Beckmeyer, and joining us today is a true giant in the field of television history. I'm Bob Thompson. I'm a professor of television and popular culture at Syracuse University, where I've been for 32 years. I've written or edited six books on American television, and I've um, uh, been studying this for uh, about 40. Professor Robert Thompson is from Syracuse University's renowned SI Newhouse School of Public Communication, and he's the trustee professor of television and popular culture. Professor Thompson has been called a pop culture ambassador for a reason. His infectious enthusiasm and insightful analysis have graced hundreds of media outlets. Professor Thompson has spent his career deciphering the media landscape, understanding its impact on our minds and on our democracy. In this conversation, he'll be our map through the maze, helping us see how media shapes our narratives, how outrage fuels the machine, and most importantly, how we can reclaim our role as informed citizens, not just passive consumers. So prepare to get schooled, in the best way possible, by the master of television history, Professor Robert Thompson. So I've, I've looked into a little bit of this history of TV stuff like and, and, and things like the Fairness Doctrine, and, and I'm old enough to remember Walter Cronkite. So uh, I know a little, you know, I have a little bit of personal history of some of the early t- earlier TV. Uh, and we had Jeffrey Berry, who wrote The Outrage Industry um, as well, uh, which, you know, is an interesting story, but it's a little bit more recent history. Um, you know, and it seems, it feels to me like, well, again, before I start, let's, let, let me thank you for, for making time to come on the show, Professor Thompson. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, so yeah, you're welcome, and thanks for coming on. So uh, the, using fear and outrage as a selling technique, you know, probably goes back to about as long as humans started communicating. Um, you know, and I think of things like the sort of snake oil salesman type things, and um, and and using the idea of outrage to sort of in the TV space is also, I probably goes back farther than I'm, I'm thinking, you know, and I'm thinking of this r- ramping up a lot in the nineties and subsequently, but I would not be surprised that it, you could probably point me to that. Oh no, this was way before that. So I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think. When did this idea of kind of using fear and outrage to build audiences and maintain them re- really started, started coming into the, into TV and, and did it build from something prior like radio or other media? Yeah, well, you certainly write that uh, using fear as a rhetorical device uh, goes back uh, as long as people have been making speeches and uh, uh, using rhetorical devices. Obviously, one of the ways to get people to come around to your way of thinking uh, is to make them afraid of something and you provide the solution to uh, whatever that is uh, uh, that you're afraid of. Uh, Certainly, this... uh, starts pretty early in the electronic media uh, in this country. Certainly Father Coughlin in uh, uh, radio was considered one of the uh, huge and very powerful and influential uh, characters that was talking about this way back before television was uh, was invented. And then we had uh, uh, shows uh, uh, back in the 1960s on television, uh, that did this uh, uh, kind of thing as well. The Dr- Les Crane show back on ABC, uh, that was at 64 to 1965 or so. Uh, the Joe Pine show around that same time. We're doing the kinds of things that uh, we would come to think of in this whole trash TV genre. But, you know, broadcasting in this country was really limited by not only the rules against uh, uh, obvious sorts of things that the FCC and before that the Federal Radio uh, uh, Commission uh, uh, would have put upon them, but generally and even more importantly, uh, the rules within the standards and practices of the broadcast networks themselves on radio and then on television. They didn't want to offend anybody. 
They wanted to maximize their audience, which at that time was not a, uh, a specific targeted audience, but was a diversified audience of uh, the entire population. And they certainly didn't want to in, uh, uh, offend advertisers who were even more worried about offending uh, viewers uh, for fear that they were going to get boycotts or be associated with something that they didn't want their product uh, uh, associated with. So with a couple of those exceptions uh, that I just mentioned, uh, we got into well into the 1980s where television and before that radio was really, really careful about what it put on the air. Uh, Back in the radio uh, day, a very famous Mae West uh, uh, routine on the Edgar Bergen uh, show uh, where she made some relatively suggestive remarks in a sketch uh, uh, where she was in the Garden of Eden. This was considered hugely controversial, and Mae West didn't appear on radio again uh, for the most part ever uh, after that. If you were to go back and listen to that sketch, which you can, it was uh, 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 recorded, even though it was a live broadcast, uh, you, you wouldn't believe that this was something that caused all of this uh, controversy. And the same went into the uh, uh, television era, right up to what the debut of All in the Family in um, uh, January of 1971, I guess it was. For the most part, television completely avoided issues of controversy, issues of what was going on in the real world. We got it in the news, that was for sure, but we didn't get it in uh, primetime or in those other uh, territories. I suppose daytime got a little earlier start on this with the soap opera, but that was kind of off in its own uh, walled off era. It was in the 1980s where this really began to open up. And I think part of it was that it used to be the broadcasters could afford to have these very strict standards and practices because they were an oligopoly. There were three networks. uh, The competition was limited. As we move into the 1980s, cable starts providing people with all this other stuff they can watch on television. And if they're willing to pay for a premium channel, they can see violence and swearing and nudity and all of the other uh, kinds of things as well. And as that began to chip away at the broadcast dominance, uh, they began to try to come up with ideas that they were going to be able to keep audiences in that new environment. Just to give you a number, Uh, As we moved into 1980, the new decade, less than a quarter of the population was hooked up to cable. It was about 23%. That would double very, very quickly and continue to go up. So by the time we get into the late uh, uh, 1980s, we've got uh, uh, Geraldo Rivera doing some of his shows that would very much go into the trash TV uh, category, as people called it uh, back then. Morton Downey, Downey Jr., who, uh, what, four years before Jerry Springer hit the air, was doing some really outrageous uh, uh, kinds of things, controversial subjects. He would chain smoke. He was deliberately a loud mouth, and he knew it. His whole logo was a big mouth. Uh, that was the show's uh, uh, trademark. Um, So really, this kind of thing that we think of it as the modern trash TV didn't have much room, except for a few little places like Joe Pine and company uh, to move in. Um, But it certainly did when we got into the 1980s and Geraldo and Jerry Springer and Morton Downey Jr. uh, were followed by all kinds of others uh, uh, um, that would come on as well, Maury and Sally Jesse Raphael and on and on and on. Yeah. And some of that speaks to the, like you said, the sort of broadening the more channels meant channels could niche down more. Whereas when there was only three, they had to sort of speak to a broader audience. What was fascinating is that uh, most of this stuff was uh, in the daytime. If we're talking about the the talk shows, which kind of planted their flag here uh, even earlier than reality TV, which would then take over Uh, some of this territory. Uh, But these were on uh, in the daytime, oftentimes scheduled right when kids were getting home and all of that. So uh, even though you've got on one level, this fear of, you know, uh, uh, 
corrupting the children, which is always brought up uh, uh, whenever one talks about content on television. A lot of these shows were playing at a time where you potentially actually did have an audience of, uh, uh, of kids coming home from school and hearing some of this uh, uh, pretty crazy stuff. Now, I should point out right from the beginning of this conversation, while Trash TV was the name that stuck uh, for this kind of thing, and while TV Guide uh, on one of its lists, uh, probably about 2010, 2011, named Jerry Springer the worst television show in the history of American television, number one, it put uh, uh, Jerry Springer, which is saying something. There have been a lot of bad television shows. All of that was part of this real response to a certain kind of show that was dealing with a certain kind of subject with a certain kind of people. And while I don't want to, for a minute, defend an awful lot of the nonsense that went on in those uh, shows, and it had some collateral uh, damage that was played out in court cases uh, uh, later on as well, I do think there was a high degree of um, uh, elitism and a lot of other things that were playing out here. And Jerry Springer, and again, I don't want to defend everything uh, this character did, but he occasionally would very eloquently, and I would occasionally be convinced by uh, what he would say about this show, was that, look, all this period uh, uh, of the history of the medium, many, many voices have really not been heard on American television. Um, you know, you hear a lot of certain kinds of people in both scripted and unscripted television, but there's a lot of people that you don't. And he claimed that his show actually gave these people a voice. Now, I do not agree with the way that he often paraded previously voiceless folks uh, out for our amusement, for us to essentially be laughing at. So he did, in fact, make a spectacle out of a lot of people, and that was a bad thing. However, he also did give an opportunity for a number of previously voiceless uh, uh, people to in fact talk uh, uh, about their lives and their woes and their problems. And you know, Jerry, for all of the you know grief that he got uh, of being the trash TV king and all that kind of thing, he always answered, or asked serious questions of uh, the folks that he had on. He actually listened to their responses. He was very tolerant of a diversity of opinion and lifestyle and choices and people. And in the end, he would give that, I forget what he called it, uh, a final word, I think it was. And it was almost like you would attach a moral to the story at the end of an Aesop fable or uh, you know, try to use something to uh, as a parable for a wider uh, uh, set of uh, things to learn. And those final notes were very sincere, were usually very uh, uh, good little uh, morals to the story. Now, granted, this was said at the end of an episode where chairs might have been flying and leaps and blurs and all of the uh, rest of it. But there was a sense when Jerry gave that final note and ended with his sign off, uh, 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 be good to yourselves, uh, take care of yourselves and each other, I think it was. Those messages fundamentally were not bad messages. So I think I don't want to be an apologist or a defender of Jerry Springer, um, Geraldo and their like, but those shows were a lot more complicated than the title Trash TV gives them credit for. They did a lot of bad things, but I think they also did a lot of things that were not so unambiguously evil. Hmm, interesting. You know, and I, you know, in terms of some of these, the kinds of TV that we, we have now, the, the Tucker Carlson's of the world and things like that, and, 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 and the, all the folks that sort of led up to Carlson too, that's been, that kind of thing's been going on for a while. You know, I, I often kind of look at it sort of a chicken and egg question, you know, I mean, you know, which came first? Did, did, did we want the stuff or, or did, did they create a, a want in us? It seems like we do like it. Um, and do you think that in our enjoyment of, of that kind of show that, you know, the trash TV type stuff, reality TV and, and generally outraged TV in that kind of realm conditioned us to kind of expect the same thing from our news? And, and we just look for that everywhere now. 
Yeah, okay. Well, a couple of things. I think we do need to divide um, reality TV, which I think we think of as uh, the real housewives and the bachelor and survivor and that kind of thing, from trash TV, which I think very much was a term that came up describing, in, in a lot of ways, the daytime uh, talk shows of the Jerry Springer, Morton Downey Jr. Uh, variety, and a third category, which is the likes of uh, uh, the uh, news commentary shows, the Tucker Carlson's and the uh, Bill O'Reilly's and those. Those are, those are three types of programmings that may all appeal to a certain part of the human spirit, but I think those are three very different kinds of programs that have to be talked about in three uh, very separate conversations, because I think they, they do very, very uh, uh, different things. As to the question of uh, uh, where this all started and the chicken and the egg thing and everything, um, I, I think it's impossible to ever say, does programming cause us to think and behave in a certain way or do the ways in which we behave and think cause the programming that comes on? Those both happen. It would be like saying, does the rain cause the weather or does the weather cause the rain? The rain is the weather. Those two are completely linked in so many ways. And I think uh, we, the audience and what we think are in a constant dance with what the entertainment and television industry gives us and nobody leads in that dance. It's, it's back and forth in a way uh, that's completely inseparable. Um, so people who put on, especially in this country where so much television has to maximize audience because its income stream comes from advertising, which depends on the size of that audience, um, those industries are always going to be looking at the things that get the highest numbers. And as they throw various things onto the air, uh, those that we watch uh, the most, they tend to imitate and put more on. Um, and it is true that some of this stuff, and let, let's, let's forget for a minute the, uh, the news commentary, Bill O'Reilly type of thing, uh, and look toward this trash TV, Jerry Springer, uh, and reality TV, Real Housewives uh, kind of thing. Um, that is, appealing. There are things about that that I think are really fun to watch. Um, my knowledge of Jerry Springer comes not only because part of my job description is to know and have seen lots of and to have uh, tried to grapple with that show, um, but my knowledge of Jerry Springer also comes uh, from the fact that I used to watch that show not only as a uh, television professor, but as a civilian, as someone who found that show interesting and compelling uh, to watch. The same is true for episodes of The Bachelor or Temptation Island, uh, a show I may not have been proud of uh, uh, loving, but that couldn't wait till it came on every week uh, uh, in the following week. Um, part of that is it appeals to parts of us that uh, are not uh, terribly admirable. <laughs> and I'm 63. I grew up watching certainly the news, but a lot of very scripted television, which was very, very similar. Nuclear families that solved all their problems at the end of uh, uh, every episode, and a whole childhood full of flying nuns and talking horses and genies and all of this kind of, uh, kind of thing, prehistoric animated families. And when these programs start coming out, first the, the, the talk shows, and we start seeing people who aren't actors, who don't all look like they came out of uh, central casting, who have got a series of problems and ways of speaking and uh, vocabulary that wasn't right out of a sitcom or a doctor show or a detective show. It was interesting if for no other reason than it was different. We didn't see or hear these kinds of stories. We didn't see or hear this kind of language on television. And we hadn't for its uh, uh, entire history. And then reality TV took that idea and very carefully and artistically crafted it through heavy editing and all the rest of it into these uh, highly dramatic uh, uh, stories uh, like The Survivor and The Bachelor and all of these, that when they were done well, were really hard not to kind of fall into. They were 
really, really uh, 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 compelling. Again, I'm not defending them. A lot of what went on in those shows uh, was highly problematic in my uh, eyes, um, but they were fun to watch. And part of that is they weren't just another sitcom. They weren't just another cop show. Uh, they were something completely different. When the real world, which uh, comes right on the heels of the golden age, if we want to call that, of the trash TV daytime talk shows, um, when the real world comes out in 1992, it was doing something really, really different. It wasn't a traditional documentary. Uh, that's in, and some of those followed real people around and all the rest of it. It was a situation where we took a bunch of people deliberately brought together for the sake of the, the fireworks that they would cause, putting them in one place and only then doing a documentary about these people who would never have lived where they were living with each other, would have never known each other. It was, it, it was as much a chemistry experiment as it was a television show. And that was a new way of telling a story. And it did some really interesting things. In the case of early real world, uh, the, the, the character of Pedro, I think raised consciousness of a lot of people um, uh, about you know their their uh, gay fellow citizens that a lot of tolerance training and a lot of other things uh, uh, had not done. Pedro became a very important figure, recognized by the president uh, 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 at the end of his life, and that was done not on a you know a PBS show. That was done on something that a lot of people considered the second generation of trash TV, uh, MTV's real world. Hmm. And that's something that's, that's an interesting perspective. Uh, an interesting bit of history that I sort of forgot about. Yeah. Um, so do you think there's, you know, we've already talked about how, you know, we like this stuff and it's entertaining and we want to watch it. And obviously it's, it's been a, and it's all, it's also kind of a, it's like an easy, uh, cheap, type of, 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 of media to produce. You don't really need that much, many writers to, to have one of these reality shows. You don't need that many, you don't, it doesn't, it's, it's relatively easy to make and pretty cheap and people really like it. So, I mean, people just, it seems like uh, the media companies tend to just, well, let's just dial that in because we can just automatically get some viewership. I mean, do you think there's anything that could change, we could do to change those incentives so that we would get less of this outrage style um, news commentary? Okay, well, in, in, uh, so now we're talking specifically about the news commentary. Um, uh, at the bottom of this, of course, is the fact that our news shows in this country are uh, advertiser supported, both the networks um, uh, that do news and the three major 24-hour uh, cable channels. And most of this fear-mongering news uh, commentary has been uh, on the 24-hour cable channel. So let's let's talk about uh, that uh, specifically. Already, there is all kinds of incentives to really, really uh, cater to, I'd go so far as to say pander to, um, whatever chunk of an audience you can get there, because there isn't much to choose from. They are scrambling from a comparatively small number of people. So the 24-hour news uh, uh, channels on cable, MSNBC, CNN, and Fox News. If you add up the total audiences during prime time of them on any given night, on a good night, you're going to get what? Maybe 5 million people. Uh, we were talking about how Tucker Carlson was the big hit, the, the leader in the, uh, uh, in the genre uh, when he was fired, and he was getting 3 million a night. Uh, CNN and MSNBC were getting considerably lower than that. So let's say 5 million all across the board on a given night. There are, what, 330, 40 million people in the country. There are 160 million voters in the country. We're talking about total number of people that are regular watchers of cable news and therefore uh, watchers of their advertisements. Um, the total number is statistically tiny compared to the overall population of the country. and. Once upon a time, CNN, starting in what was it, June of 1980, uh, CNN pretty much had that small number of people to themselves. 
in the mid 90s, one right after the other, Fox and MSNBC come along and suddenly that comparatively small audience is being divided up in three ways, not in, uh, uh, in one way. And that means that uh, there really has to be a scramble to get uh, you know, enough uh, audience to, uh, to pay the bills for the budget of uh, all these kinds of things. And while you're right, it is true that these commentary shows are um, easy to do. They're one set, they're comparatively uh, uh, simple. And they're cheap maybe in the beginning, but they're not so cheap when, they, when the, the person who's on them becomes a big hit. Uh, Tucker Carlson was not a cheap guy to keep on the air before they, uh, uh, before they fired him. So there is going to be that tendency is how are we going to maximize our audience, especially in prime time, and you know, simply someone having an intelligent discussion about a specific topic that's trying to get at the actual uh, just the facts, ma'am type of uh, things it is really hard to make as compelling as something that has built into it all of this dramatic uh, stuff. You know, when you turn on to an episode of Rachel Maddow or an episode of Tucker Carlson, that the drama was already built in. The protagonists had been set, the antagonists had been set, and we were going to see that play out. Just like whenever you turn into an episode of Law and Order, you know what you're going to get. There's going to be uh, uh, an investigation. There's going to be a court case. And then you simply plug in a, you know, a, a single story uh, into those things. We, I, I think that tends to be something that is going to attract more viewers, especially after a long day's work. It's, uh, uh, it's in the evening. You're slouching toward bedtime. Um, you know, sometimes... And I'm not just talking about some vast audience. Sometimes even a thinking uh, person in an audience does not necessarily want to uh, uh, go through the intellectual exercise that watching good journalism requires. So you asked the question, and I'm sorry it took me half an hour to get there, is that are there any pl- ways we can make incentives that will make this, that will kind of take that formula down? it would be really difficult because to to address that problem would be we'd have to address the two major uh, parts of the calculus, of the equation. And that would be, number one, address the audience, how can we make uh, news, good journalism, not fear-mongering threats to the civic uh, institutions of the country, which some of this fear-mongering stuff is. How do we make good journalism, more appealing, so people will want that instead of the other thing? Well, that's a tough, tough question. Uh, I guess public education would be the simple answer, but enacting that answer is, of course, we found over the centuries, uh, uh, not not as simple. The other part of the equation we have have to address is the people who are putting up the shows that we have the choices to watch. And that would mean you know, how do we give them the incentive to give us good journalism as opposed to what else they uh, uh, want to give us? And that's also problematic because we can't tell private companies what to do. We can put little bits of guardrails on them, obscenity laws and uh, that kind of thing. Um, But it's, uh, I, I don't know, federal subsidies for good journalism Let's even say that would happen, which would have all kinds of problems. Who gets to be the one that decides what is good journalism? And we're right back where we started. Yeah. You know, I I was thinking of a caused me to think of a quote. I think this is from uh, David Mark. I think the, I don't know when this book came out, but I think it's early '90s. And but David it, Mark, it, by the way, was my best friend. Uh, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, he and I wrote two books together. I was going to say I, I don't know if you edited this book or were involved in it, but the quote I was going to read was: "We are re- we are reminded both that the news broadcasts were once made of sterner stuff, and that millions of Americans watched mainly because there was nothing else on." I could not agree. Um, uh, I could not agree more. I mean that the that that would be. The solution to this problem was uh, we get a a look at when we look at the days uh, before K-12 
cable and the internet and all that kind of thing, which is when you only had three channels in some cities, even fewer than that, um, one didn't have to be so competitive. They could put Walter Cronkite on there and he was the only game in town. Well, there were two others, but they were doing the uh, exact same thing. Uh, so that is true. Uh, I, I, here's a perfect example. When I was a kid, I remember um, I'd turn on the TV to watch my favorite show and it would be the State of the Union address. And I had no interest in what, listening to the State of the Union address. So I turned in another ch the other channel. It was the State <laughs> of the Union address. And the next channel was, you guessed it, State of the Union address. So what did I do? I could either turn off the TV, which was not a viable option for me on some uh, evenings, or I could sit through the State of the Union address, hoping against hope that it would be short so that happy days would come on uh, like it was scheduled to uh, afterwards. Um, and that had some advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages were three companies essentially had control of the entire uh, you know, what, what, was, what was the most dominant communication force ever invented, broadcast television. And that means we only got what came from those very specific threes company, which means the types of voices were very limited. The types of stories we heard were very limited. Um, all the problems with having three companies control that big of a media uh, landscape. That was the problem. The advantage to it was there was a sense in which, because everybody watched the same thing at the same time, that there were a few places where everybody could sort of agree on this great center. And I think Walter Cronkite was a good example of that. Uh, he was called at the time the most trusted man in America. And you could have an argument in 1969 um, about the war or drugs or the sexual revolution or whatever over the Thanksgiving table. And everybody could kind of base what they were saying and base their opinions at least on an agreed upon set of facts or set of information. And that's what the oligopoly era gave us. And again, that had its own problem. Now, of course, there's the sense, and I'm certainly not the first person to say this, where everybody has got their own set of information and facts which they go to. And in many cases, those sets of facts have built into them a denial of any other set of facts, which means conversation, civic uh, engagement becomes complete anarchy. And we see that playing out day after day uh, after day. So David Mark was right about that. Would we want to go back to a time when only three companies could uh, uh, control all that stuff? I don't think so, uh, but I, I certainly don't think we've uh, figured out how to do what we're doing now with any effectiveness uh, toward keeping us from slouching toward the end of the Republic. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think that quote also speaks to the idea that we we sort of would rather not have to put in that sort of cognitive load to process a Walter Cronkite, but when it was the only thing on, we would do it. Right. And it was only a half hour long. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, uh, the nightly news uh, uh, shows were only 15 minutes long until the fall of 1963. Yeah. You know, and now that was, that's a whole nother issue where they're, they're trying to fill 24 hours. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's pretty clear that certainly the MSNBCs and the Fox News, is, they're not actually going to change anyone's mind, and that's not the problem one way or the other. In terms of they're not going to cause anybody to switch sides, I don't think. But their, their, their thing that they do is that by constantly telling us how evil the other side is, we, we sort of believe it, right? And, and we get this, and this division becomes more, you know, the scientists call it affective polarization or some other terms as well, where we, we're basically making all our decisions and we, we, we sort of go in with a predisposed idea that the other side is evil and wrong and doesn't care about the country. And it kind of just takes away our ability to have um, good dialogue and good conflict, basically, which is kind of the cornerstone of, of democracy. Uh, so, so, I mean... It's like that's the thing that I'm most concerned about with these shows is how they just keep driving that wedge into the division. 
Um, and they do, an, and you could you could argue MSNBC and Fox are at different de- say things of different degree, but it's the same basic business model, the same basic idea of just reinforcing our psychological, you know, sort of moral indignation and moral superiority, sort of. And and I mean, do you have this is a big ask, but I mean, do you have any ideas? I mean, again, some of this is the uh, we met the enemy and it's us thing, but uh, I mean, do you have any ideas how? You, I think you even mentioned something about how this is kind of tearing democracy apart. Um, I mean, do you have any ideas for how we can roll this back or protect our own ourselves from it? Uh, alas, I don't. Um, I mean, I, I think the uh, uh, these these technologies and, and they, they they really did come. Uh, they really did start coming at an awfully quick uh, pace. I mean, I'm thinking of you know, radio gets uh, developed in the 1920s and it hangs around for a a couple of decades and then TV comes in and with some exceptions, color TV and uh, 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 that kind of thing, that that technology is pretty stable for a a fairly long time. By the way, it's interesting when you said uh, anybody watching MSC Fox, whatever, they're not going to have their mind changed. That is a big difference. And that's what this technology has brought. The big difference from the broadcast era is people's minds were constantly changed during that era. There were a lot of people who went into the early days of the Vietnam War, uh, 1964, 65, um, you know, very much in support of uh, the president and very much in support of uh, the war. And then by watching uh, Morley Safer's famous uh, uh report from Cam Nee, the Zippo lighter story, they called it, uh, American soldiers burning down these uh, uh, very poor old people's uh, grass houses. Um, certainly the coverage from uh, uh, the Tet Offensive uh, reports in 1968. And then very importantly, good old Walter Cronkite comes up again, his editorial in 1968, when he got back from Vietnam, where he essentially says, we've got to get out of this mess one way or the other. There are a lot of people who were very, very much died in the wool, uh, pro-war folks, anti-hippie, anti-all that kind of thing, who gradually changed their mind to the extent that Lyndon Johnson may or may not have said the quote that he's always given, uh, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost the country. Um, And he didn't even run uh, for his second term uh, after that. So back then, there was a sense that good rhetoric, that a well-argued uh, uh, report could in fact convince people one way or the other. You point out that uh, that doesn't happen on MSNBC, Fox, whatever. I agree with you that it doesn't. And I think the, the cause of that is the advance in technology, which has given us both glorious, glorious things. I have millions of encyclopedias in my pocket, glorious things. Many people have voices that didn't before, but it's also brought us to this state of affairs. And um, it, when, when you ask, can we roll that back? I don't know how one could possibly roll back. Uh, uh, I mean, part of it would be, you know, getting, uh, taking the million little pieces that the audience has been fragmented in and somehow putting them back together, but putting them back together better than they were in the first place by, uh, so that we wouldn't have to throw out all the good things that happened. Um, I, I have, uh, I'm at a loss as to any suggestions as to how to do that. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I'm going to ask you because I don't think those channels are even trying to change anyone's mind. I don't think uh, Fox is trying to bring someone from the left into their. No, I agree. Everything we're talking about here is, is kind of, like you say, it's kind of yesterday's news to a degree because younger people are getting most of their information from things like TikTok and YouTube. Right. However, someone, they, you know, the, the things that they, uh, that they post and that they mess with on uh, TikTok and all the rest of it, uh, a lot of that stuff still is traceable to people that are actually gathering news. Right. That is very true. Yeah. Less and less of it, maybe. But there is still because uh... it is kind of funny. People say TikTok has everything when then you go to a TikTok and it's just a clip from regular to TV. CNN, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I uh, really appreciate your time. I, I hopefully I didn't did dr- draw you in too long, but I, I really enjoyed speaking with you, Professor Thompson. 
That was lots of fun. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have any follow-up, you know where to find me. All right. Thanks so much. I, I will. Thanks. Talk Thank to you later. You. Uh, Bye. Bye-bye. That is it for this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. For links to everything we talked about on this episode, go to outrageoverload.net. I wanted to take a moment to, again, thank all the listeners and contributors. If you have a question, please send it. Email me at outrageoverload at gmail.com. I'll make sure every question gets an answer, so keep them coming. And if you received any value from today's episode, please return that value, value for value as we call it, by going to outrageoverload.net slash contribute and buy me a coffee or better yet for as little as three dollars a month you can become a subscriber to get access to exclusive subscriber only content and other perks thanks for listening and check back in a few weeks for a fresh new episode